Spitalfields is known to many of us today as a district of London that, in the Victorian era, was characterised by extreme poverty, was the haunt of Jack the Ripper and also home to some of his victims. This is, perhaps, understandable, given the attention it's received in numerous modern novels and movies. This picture of life is much removed from what the area is today, an inner-city destination well known for its fashionable shops and restaurants, as well as being home to multi-million pound homes and businesses. But in the late 1800s, it was a notorious slum, with countless dark and dangerous courts and alleys overrunning with men, women, boys, ragged children and animals. Here, poor dock labourers, hawkers and costermongers lived in dilapidated houses, alongside the coarsest thieves and prostitutes. But there were also poor silk weavers that clung hopelessly to a withering handicraft. It is these people that were the last vestiges of a time before the descent into dystopia. The story of the economic decline in their trade, alongside furniture making, goes some way to revealing why the fortunes of Spitalfields and its residents declined. Today, in an account by a Victorian journalist writing in the early 1890s, you will discover what Spitalfields was like in the early 1800s with a fascinating account of his conversations with old and poor weavers, many of whom had family connections with France. The district was a thriving centre for the silk industry, many craftsmen being descendants of Protestant Huguenot refugees that had fled France under the persecution of Louis XIV. This was a time when there were tens of thousands of weavers, and just as many looms, the streets were lined with workshops, and master weavers were wealthy enough to build grand houses. But all this was to change, and by the 1890s, there were just hundreds, not thousands, who remained at their looms. Following the removal of tariffs on the import of French goods in 1860, wine, brandy and silk, wages shrank to such an extent that many of these skilled workers turned to labouring and street hawking to clothe and feed themselves. Old houses fell to pieces, and mean terraces and lodging houses were built in their place. Yet some, old, lacking the physical ability to leave behind a lifetime of work and bereft of hope, struggled on at their looms, in the bad air of filthy garrets, and it is from these people that we learn the story of their lives. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was, really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us continue bringing the past alive. For many years I have felt more than a common interest in Spitalfields, for as a near suburb of the greatest city in the world, the parish can boast of a history that is quite exceptional in features of attraction. Centuries ago, when St. Paul's Cross was an institution of old London for open-air preaching, the Spittal, about a mile away, was another station hardly less celebrated on account of the great orators who spoke to the multitude. In those days the fields were close at hand, and even in the memory of persons still living, at least one field still remained. The whole area is now entirely built over. The characteristics of the place are changing, for impoverished people and others are arriving from foreign countries and overcrowd the houses. I first became acquainted with Spitalfields through its ragged school, which has stations in King Edward Street and Albert Street, the whole being now a far-reaching home mission work, which confers great benefit on a very large constituency. In the pioneer days of between forty and fifty years ago, the work actually commenced in a disused cowshed, but now, when the jubilee of the great movement is near at hand, the Spitalfield School is second to none in the country in point of efficiency. Its success is largely due to the energy and enthusiasm of Mr. Charles Montague, the honorary superintendent.
time after time I have explored Spitalfields in company with this veteran, and thus understand the place as I never could have done apart from the information received from one who may be called a specialist in his own department. But in the limits at disposal, it will not be possible to depict all the varied phases of life in Spitalfields. Otherwise, one might speak of the great brewery, of the last sugar refinery, which has now disappeared from the scene, and of the Sunday morning bird fair, a rival of Petticoat Lane, a mile away. Excelling all these things in interest, however, are the weavers, who are fewer in number now than they have been for some generations, and who may possibly become extinct before very long. On all sides the houses of these artistic silk workers are to be seen, as well as the mansions which were once the homes of the masters. But what changes in the outlook have been wrought by time? There used to be about 25,000 weavers in Spitalfields and Bethnal Green, and now there are probably not more than 500, although many who are left still retain those old French names, which prove them to have come of families which were once more than respectable among the Huguenots of France. Having so often walked about Spitalfields to take notice of the rooms which were constructed for silk weavers' workshops, and of the comfortable old houses in which the masters lived and thrived, I felt desirous to meet with some of the poorer sort of people, to hear them explain the general outlook as it appeared to themselves. Mr. Montague, accordingly, invited several representatives of a fast-declining class to assemble at the Albert Street station of the King Edward Mission, and we had quite a happy afternoon reunion. The company was chiefly made up of old people who had passed their lives at silk weaving and who were disposed to communicate all they knew. Though not one of them could speak in French, some retained the Gallic features of their ancestors, and those who had not actually French names could tell of French connections a generation or two back. They could, moreover, talk of old France with some sympathy, although not one of them had ever seen the sunny land. One veteran who is eighty-six years old, has to confess that he cannot boast of a pure French name, but then his mother had been Mademoiselle Le Gabriel, and that name was French. His family had come from Nice, which was the weaving district, and his father and grandfather were weavers before him. He can explain all about the difference between plain and figured work, while he naturally looks back with some affection on the days of his youth when times were better for his industry. Another who is sitting close by appears to be almost young in comparison, for he is only seventy. He has always been employed at the best work, and thus in the better times of a generation or so ago he was able to earn two pounds a week. In making a certain magnificent shawl, his father had earned two pounds a day. He has such notions of silk-weaving as an art that he says one may go on improving through a lifetime and never become so perfect, but that there is still something to learn. At the same time, it is an extremely tedious business to learn, and the common belief of our company is that if a child is to be taught weaving, he must learn nothing else, for if school learning is mixed up with work at the loom, the youngster will be sure to run away in despair. One aged woman, who has passed her life in Spitalfields, among the weavers, tells us about her great-grandfather, who could speak only a little English, and who, as one of the original refugees, escaped from France with his life, but left much property behind him. An uncle and a brother of this aged dame, both died in the French house at St. Luke's, which has been rebuilt at Victoria Park. This aged dame and others can, of course, remember the time when three French Protestant churches were maintained within a short distance of where we are now sitting, but not one of which remains. Mention is made of Joseph Marie Jacquard, the inventor of the ingenious contrivance for figured silk weaving, but the notions entertained respecting the distinguished weaver of Lyon are misty and erroneous. Thus the death of young Jacquard who was shot during the revolution, is confounded with that of the father, who is supposed to have been murdered by the Lyon silk workers in revenge for having invented what would supersede hand labour. The fact is, however, 
that Jacquard lived down all opposition and prejudice, and died in peace at over eighty years of age, having lived to see his invention adopted throughout Europe and America. Like other inventions of the kind, this increased hand labour rather than diminished it. I learn on the excellent authority of the assembled company that the best Spitalfield silk is still the best, but that inferior sorts can be got even in such a region. It strikes one as being an odd coincidence that the blackest side of the silk manufacture is connected with black material. The black silk trade has been ruined by the dyers, for silk weighing 16 ounces to the pound is increased in weight to 30 ounces to the pound. It's sold by weight, you know, and this is made to sell and look at and not to wear. That is a singular confession, but it does not seem to be exaggerated. It looks beautiful, but the dye rots the material and it won't wear. No wonder, then, that the young lady who asked how it happened that the silk cracked received an unsatisfactory answer. Someone else mentioned the matter to a master weaver, but so long as the latter made his money, he did not care. This only refers to black silk, however, silk of the other colours being actually reduced in weight by the dyeing process. It was not a practice in the olden time, and of course the tendency is towards the ruin of the black silk trade altogether. Our company generally agree in the opinion that the silk weaving is coming to an end so far as Spitalfields is concerned. There are very few masters now, and streets of workshops have disappeared. Still, these old people seem to have sunny memories of the good old times. It's a wonderful trade, never really learned, but the young folks will not stick to it, and a very good job too. They get a little education, and then go out into the world and get good situations. If you want to be a good silk weaver, you must be a dunce at everything else. One old man who was put at the loom at ten year old says that children used to be kept at work from morning till night and all the education he got himself was at a Sunday school. Was there much drinking among the old people of other days? Well, among some of them, there was. You see, the old people never thought much of providing for a rainy day. They generally reckoned on getting into the French house when they was done up. The French house? I will say something about that presently. Meanwhile, as one looks on these descendants of leading French Huguenot families, what shall be said of their having come down to their present lowly condition? I notice that Mr. Montague hands to each a gratuity for the trouble of coming to entertain us, and this is gratefully received and well deserved. A large number all around benefit in one way or another by the King Edward Mission School. If you were to look through the Sunday morning congregation, you would meet with one or another whose name would at once remind you of old France under Louis the Fourteenth and the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. Of another, you might say, your ancestors were leading traders at Lyon, while a third might strike you as being even aristocratic. And yet these interesting people are now to be found in the poorest of rooms, where they will bring forth from safe hiding places certificates and other family papers in French, which in some instances seem to bear striking testimony to their owners, former standing in the world. In one room, more especially close at hand, we were privileged to look upon what was probably as prosperous a weaver's workshop as could be found in the district. There was a loom at each end, one being worked by the husband and one by the wife, and the woman, who began by working under her father, had used the same loom in that same room for sixty years. From below, the apartment was reached by a narrow stairs and a trapdoor in the floor, which could be closed to economise space. A bed and washstand occupied the middle of the room, which thus had to serve for sleeping as well as working. All was well kept as could be under the conditions, and the old couple showed some excusable pride in exhibiting what might be called the credentials of their family. These are papers, some in French and some in English, relating to marriages, etc. Then they produce a magnificent piece of coloured silk work, framed like a picture, and which was expressly manufactured for the Great Exhibition of 1851. Other samples of their artistic industry are also forthcoming, and when these are characterised by the admiring wife as lovely goods, we feel that the compliment is by no means undeserved. 
it strikes one as showing an anomalous state of things in our English industrial world, when a man and a woman, who appear thus to have perfected their art, can hardly earn sufficient even to maintain the modest little home in which they have lived from youth to old age. As hard-working, honest folk, they have a claim on our regard. While as descendants of the Huguenots, whom that elegant profligate Louis the Fourteenth would have exterminated, they excite our interest. The French pasteurs of a former generation have left no successors, but happily their flock are not left desolate so long as the Albert Street mission and school extends to them its sympathy as a centre of Christian influence. Mr. Montague is as good as a pastor to such, so that those who would befriend these remnants of a dying clan can do so by supporting the institution of which my friend is the honorary superintendent. It has to be borne in mind that what is called a ragged school extends its help to the surrounding poor of all ages and conditions. The French house, into which some of these old people may possibly be received to spend the last days of their life, is now found at Victoria Park, and it is a striking kind of building, with a foreign face, said to be an exact copy of a palace erected by one of the French kings, it was put up about a quarter of a century ago, and is the successor of the hospice provided in London at the beginning of the last century for the relief of the poor and the aged among the refugees. Speaking generally, the people arrived in England in a state of great destitution, and although large sums were subscribed by Londoners and others for their relief, there was great need for the asylum which de Gastini founded in 1708. Though a refugee who had fled for his life like the others, this benefactor was able to give one thousand pounds towards the building of a house for which George I granted a royal charter of incorporation. Having beautiful garden grounds in the suburban parish of St. Luke, the original house was a pleasant place, but in time the income declined and the managers were obliged to let part of their garden for building. We can imagine the extreme reluctance with which such a step was taken, the present managers remark. Yet the result has shown its prudence, for by the aid of the increased value of the land and the income derived from the leases which are now falling in, the directors of the present day have been enabled, without any fresh appeal to the public, to erect and maintain the building which adorns the north side of Victoria Park, and which affords a home, replete with every comfort, to twenty men and forty women, being aged and poor descendants of French Protestant refugees. We find it most interesting to walk over the hospital in company with the steward and to converse with some of the inmates. It is a light, airy, prettily designed place with charming grounds, having a chaplain and a chapel of its own, in which, on one day in the year, the service has to be conducted in French. Though the chaplain is an ordained clergyman of the Church of England, the inmates do not all belong to the established church, but to various non-conformist denominations. Here you may meet with some of the last of the weavers who will talk about the old times in Spitalfields, when there were two or three Huguenot churches, and when the French house still stood in St. Luke's.